morning, uh, Hanshi. Uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you, first of all, for taking your time to um, have this discussion with me and to bring it to the viewers around the world. Well, it's uh, of interest that uh, your online magazine has become so popular. Uh, I've uh, heard many of my students say that they subscribe to it now. And it, it's interesting. It's a lot easy to, easier to publish today than it was back in 1956. Oh. <laughs> That's when your first book came out? Uh, well, it came out in 62, actually, but I had uh, written it during uh, the years from 58 through uh, 60, and it took a long time to create a book back then. I mean, everything was, was very manual. Today, you, you can throw a book together pretty quickly. Right, right. So, um, I, if you could give a little background for those people that have not been introduced to you yet, I would appreciate that. Well, I, I did a tour of duty on Okinawa in 1956 through 1958, and uh, I was in the Army Security Agency, uh, which was more run like a business than a, than a military uh, uh, camp. And that gave me a lot of free time. So when I, uh, I was getting into all kinds of trouble. If you read uh, my last book, uh, The Way of Wage You Across, they uh, like went into that, that those details. Uh, they, were, they weren't exactly things that I sh should have published, I suppose. But I, I got into a lot of trouble. And, and someone mentioned to me uh, that there, there was a program called uh, Karate that the Okinawans were famous for. And, uh, a lot of the Okinawans were, uh, t t uh, you know, a lot of our, our people that, that worked for us were like in houseboy uh, positions, and uh, they, they did menial tasks. And, and here they were, uh, masters of the martial arts, but nobody really knew about it. But I got friendly with one of the the houseboys, and they were, he was telling me that I should look into karate, which I eventually did and uh, ended up training for a little over a year, seven days a week, as a private student of Ryuko Tamiyoshi, uh, who was still alive. And he, actually, he was only 10 years older than me. You know, so, but yet he had trained with uh, Kangum Weiji as a youth, and uh, Kame Weiji, uh, who was at that time the grand master of the Weiji system. So I had a, a, a magnificent experience and uh, when I finished my tour of duty, came home, uh, I started practicing at the YMCA in Boston. And uh, before long, I had the whole judo squad working out with me. And uh, I was just overwhelmed with the, the whole idea of all of a sudden going from a student uh, who probably could have spent another 10 years studying, but all of a sudden I was teaching. And of course, as you're teaching, you're beginning to explore the, you know, why you do things, and you're getting all these questions that you have to answer. Right. And so at that time, I, prom I promised uh, Tamiyoshi and Weiji, Weiji Sensei that I would try to popularize the, the style. And of course, nobody even knew what the word meant uh, back in the 50s here in the United States. And uh, over a period of time, uh, you know, a book came together called The, the Way of Karate. And it became, became quite a famous book uh, on Okinawa. Uh, many of the servicemen who, uh, you know, normally wouldn't take advantage of, of it, all of a sudden were, were finding this book in some of the bookstores, and then starting to look for martial arts. And uh, it, you know, it just caught on really, really fast after that. So that's pretty much my experience, and I've been doing it ever since. Right. Uh, now, you were responsible for bringing karate uh, all the way to Massachusetts. You were probably the first one uh, doing karate in Massachusetts, am I correct? That's correct. Uh, I had, uh, well, I got my start at the YMCA and uh, eventually moved to a, uh, a facility on the fifth floor of, in Boylston Street, which is now the, uh, the government center. And, uh, you know, that goes into all of the opportunities that I missed. I could have bought the building for $23,000. Wow. <laughs> you know, and within 10 years, it was worth a million dollars. But I got thrown out of there because of the re reconstruction of the, the area. And then I went to, to Columbus Avenue and, and taught. And uh, 
eventually, you know, I, I guess I was the only one because I had people coming from all over, all over the, the, the New England area. I had classes uh, filled with students from uh, Connecticut, Vermont, and New Hampshire, you know, they came right. all over. But uh, the martial arts grew so rapidly, and as the servicemen began coming back, and uh, people, you know, started to talk about the martial arts, karate specifically, uh, they, they're all of a sudden there were uh, schools on every street corner. You know, they, 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 Flight and uh, uh, the, the story of just about any anything, you know, it, it, it just grows so rapidly, and all of a sudden you're in this uh, whirlwind. But at one time, I when I the last move before uh, I, I decided to move to Florida, I had over 500 students at the uh, in the government center, uh, the new government center, and. Uh, you know, it was just a, a, an amazing uh, turn of events. But uh, I just got burnt out, and at, at some point, you know, things were so much different back then than it is today. It wasn't so much, you were, you were faced with a, a business, but I was still into the realm of, of not charging students for tuition, not really, uh, you know, not, not having contracts and all that. And, and you know, so you had a, a constant flow of students coming and going. It's a lot different than it is today. But sure. Back then, it, it was quite stressful, and uh, I had a lot of fun, and, and I learned a lot. But uh, many of my students are still students now, and, and now they mm -hmm. all own dojos, and they're all very, very famous in their own right. So uh, I, I guess. Uh, being the first one has its benefits and its uh, pitfalls. Sure. And I've experienced both of them. <laughs> well, we got introduced to each other back in 1996, I believe, with uh, from Steve Diurio, one of your students uh, back at the time, uh, approaching you on doing a uh, video for the Weichi Ru Main 3 um, Kata and uh, Q Show. Right. And I... I I am so thankful that you uh, accepted the um, the offer to, for me to do that because um, that really launched my career. Uh, those three films um, have gone worldwide, and I appreciate you allowing me to um, enter into that uh, realm. Well, I, I guess Weiji has gained as much as you have in that respect because we discovered a lot of the uh, the meanings of moves that prior to that were just they were just general movements. But having studied the uh, the films that you did, it uh, gave a little bit more substance to uh, to kappa and the importance of kappa. Right. Well, the more I, I do it, I've been uh, studying it since uh, the '96 when I met you. I've been studying those three katas and also the controversial fourth kata of Super <laughs> Hempai. Um, I've been yeah, what's your view on that, by the way, when you get a chance? I'm, I'm curious if, if you've actually uh, tried the movements or have you tried to actually learn the kata super -empe? Yes, I've been doing it since um, I, when I met uh, Bill Glasheen uh, at the summer camp that you hosted down at Mass Maritime. I don't remember the e year. I think maybe around 2000. I'm not even sure. But um, I picked up the form from him. And uh, I've been practicing it ever since on a daily basis, as with the other three main kata. Yeah, well, the, the whole concept of kata, as it's approached by the Westerners, you know, they they try to, or we try, we try to preserve it, and, and of course, in China, that concept is is. Is, is more like our concept of baseball. I mean, would we try to preserve the swing of Babe Ruth because he was very famous at the time? So are you going to try and all of a sudden everyone tries to emulate his stances and his his movement? And you know that that's a, a kind of a foreign concept to the to the Chinese. They they adapt the their styles to the individuals, and and therefore Super Empe, from the time that it was first discovered, and five years later, lots of the lots of the movements were changed. A lot of, a lot of you know, the kata has been changed, and yet we try to preserve the first version that we we've seen as though there there was some major importance to that. And, and I'm not quite sure 
you know, if that's valuable or not. I haven't yet uh, determined it because I'm still practicing San Chen, say San, San, say Ru, the way I was taught it back in 1950, 56. <laughs> right, right. Well, as I've been practicing those katas, it's really opened up Kyushu for me because the uh, katas are not like any other kata that I've seen in that the uh, hands are directly from the bubishi. There are the six energy hands that are listed in that bubishi and they're more animalistic and it's helped me um, reach into the deeper um, cavities of the body to enable the Kyushu far better. So that's the value I get from those katas besides all the rest of the, the conditioning and the iron shirt. So it's been an amazing experience with those katas and I, I will practice those forever because they, they have those hand positions and that unique capability that you don't see in any other style. There's a lot of controversy, however, in, in how much of the fine details of the kata one is actually able to perform or apply in a stressful situation. And uh, if you follow some of the blogs and some of the forums, uh, there are a lot of uh, the, the people who are into realistic type training who will, will, will say, well, you know, these very complex movements aren't very useful when you're under stress. And of course, when you're practicing the kata, I've pretty much discovered the same thing, that, that as the kata is performed, it's not, that's not the way that it, the movements are going to be u utilized under, under stress. And I'm wondering how that concept, if there's any validity to it, uh, how that uh, relates to the, the art of Kyushu, where the movements are very specific and you perform them exactly the way they're performed in the kata in application. So, that, you know, is it more the, the, the area that's being struck or the way that you are striking the area, in which case you've got to, you've got to apply movements that are very specific to the, to the kata? Well, in the, the last couple of years, that, that's been my main focus as well. And we have a mutual friend, Ed Mala. And he has a very unique way of entering in, into the fray, and he goes into the small circle jujitsu, and he can grab your wrist or your finger no matter what you do to him. Uh, and what I see is in the San Chin that um, the stepping in with the, the hands uh, outreached, I mean, that's his entry. And where you take it from there, the, the San Chin alone, I've been able to take through 10 levels of um, combatives and uh, apply it and it does it, it there is a sense of realism sometimes it's a, a little awkward when you're first practicing it but the more you get used to it it's like anything and i found a lot of value and again uh, the san chin is of course the basis that we all agree no matter what style of karate you do san chin is the the base um, and the, the other katas just flow from it mm. well my focus of study is, is, is more along the lines that Unless you're a policeman, a, a soldier entering battle where you know you are in a fight, and therefore you can, if you can see an opening and you can actually utilize a, a very uh, specific type of, of movement, uh, such as found in, um, in your cue show. Most of, of the fights, however, are surprise and, and I, I use the term like that Tony Blower has, has, has created and that, you know a flinch kind of reaction a, a, a an instinctive kind of motion and much of my kata training seems to relate to the effectiveness of how you react to something that you're not prepared for you're, you're walking down the street and someone throws something at you and, and you're uh, initial reaction is to throw your hands up and away from your body and everything in, in Wei Qi is, is moving inward so you're, you're, you're sort of building on that flinch reaction that, that V that uh, out of Seisan that, that we do, third movement of Seisan and as long as you're moving inward there's a, a better chance that you're going to be able to intercept or to stop some kind of an incoming attack then what you do after that, it's, it's on a more conscious level. So I see so much importance in, in how you're going to react to something that unexpected stress, which 90, probably 90 or, or more percent of the population, that's how they're going to be attacked. No, absolutely. You watch some of the YouTube uh, films, you know, you see people walking down the street and 
and there were some kids that were you know, doing a, you know, the, the knockout, the surprise oh, yeah. knockout mm -hmm. kind of thing. And all of it was based on the fact that the person being hit, they're not prepared for it. They don't know how to handle it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're involved in, in, in this training where everything, any kind of a flinch reaction is re related to to uh, the, the incoming movement. It's not moving away from it, trying to get away from it, and including the arms. And therefore, you're wide open to it. So my feeling is, is that the kata, from the Weiji perspective, is, is for the average person, more so than someone uh, you know, beating it out a door and knowing that there, there's, there's, there's criminals inside and you're going to have to defend yourself. Uh, it, it's not, not something you and I are going to be faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, hopefully not. But um, what I also see out of the, um, your style is the development of Iron Shirt. And uh, to protect against the Q shows or these, these malicious games that those kids were playing. Now, if you're blindsided, you're blindsided. There's not much you can do about it. But the trained uh, Weichika is going to have an Iron Shirt. And as I worked with uh, the Q show with your, your, your students, I noticed that they were far more resilient than the average person, and that's because of the Sanchin training and the iron shirt uh, inherent in it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. However, I totally am against the extreme iron shirt training that some of my uh, associates uh, are doing, and because they're giving the this false impression that Weiji is, is hitting one another and, and you know, pounding on one another and strictly trying to train your body to be strong. And uh, again, what you practice is what you're going to tr do. And if, if someone's standing in Sanchen and he's taking a lot of hard blows to the stomach where they're tensing their body overly, holding their breath, doing everything wrong, and, and taking that punch, yeah, it's training their stomach, I suppose, but uh, what's it, what's it tr preparing you for? First time someone throws a punch at you, instead of blocking it and moving away from it, you're sitting there intensely <laughs> taking the blow, all right? And how many people are going to go for the body shot, the first blow? And right. I don't care what kind of iron shirt methods you have, you can't protect your eyes, you can't protect your head. It, you know, if you get in, and, and Kyushu, as far as I'm concerned, throat, eye, eyes, uh, head points probably are the most important. And I, I just see it, uh, and, and an overuse of the iron shirt practices in Weiji. I was taught originally by Weiji Sensei and Tamiyoshi Sensei that all of your your strengthening comes from the correct practice of Sanchen. And this takes years. It's not something you can do in, in a month or two months right. or even a year. All right? Your training is such so that if you're, all you have to do is pull your shoulders down, tuck in, and that's the first action that happens when you get under stress. And that's, whether, that's not a flinch reaction, but if you know you're in a fight and the shoulders come down, you start breathing, at that point you can take a, a shot. But to, to try and, and be a, a white belt, or I've seen some, some films of people hitting uh, young girls, you know, they're standing there <laughs> shaking like a leaf, <laughs> in a sense, they've got to have wax in the stomach, and they're, you know, they're almost vomiting. Uh, it, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this is the image that Weiji is, is, uh, is having. Uh, National Geographic does a or did a video on uh, Okinawa and karate, and they, they, they described all of the martial, all of the, the karate schools, you know, and there's Shoren, and they, they do these magnificent katas and all that. And there's Goju, and they do these training, and they got these drills, and here we have Weiji, they beat on one another. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not what normal people are going to want to train. Right. I'm not going to select a, a Gojo because, hey, I want to come down, I want, want the sensei to hit me. <laughs> Anyway, I didn't mean to get carried away, but that's a that's a sore spot in my in my psyche here uh, when I see those those you know breaking baseball bats and all, and that's just trickery. It's like back in the '60s where people were were bending steel pipes in the throat and breaking all kinds of things. These are circus tricks. Anyone can break a board, you know. 
the problem is if you don't break it, then your hand gets gets hurt. And pounding on Makawaras, if you see people with the, I call them ash knuckles, <laughs> you know, from yep. misuse of the Makawara. Tommy Osi said a well trained fist which is no, looks no different than a normal fist. And he says, to anyone who has these big knuckles is from improper training and the swelling and all that. All you do is press between the knuckles and they'll scream up in pain. And he did that to a couple of my students who, uh, in spite of my warnings, uh, you know, they had to have these big knuckles as a sign of, uh, of their, their strength. And they, God, they just screamed out in pain when he just grabbed them by the, in the knuckles. Oh, that's funny. But, you know, that's just a dilemma of modern uh, martial arts is everybody's into more the uh, macho, external, got to be really tough kind of attitude rather than exploring the internal aspects of the arts as well. It's a yin and yang philosophy that most people tend to miss. But I think the, the seniors should be more aware of it as Tamiyoshi Sensei and Weiji Sensei kept telling the students. And, of course, Okinawans were no different than the Americans. Say. I would go over there on Saturdays to meet Weiji Sensei's dojo, and there were a lot of today grandmasters, and they were black belts, you know, and then nobody wore belts, and just and no one had gaze at those at that time. And they were off in the corner fighting with one another, pounding on the Makawaras, <laughs> and Weiji Sensei would be over in the corner taking students one at a time through the kata and just yelling at the students who are over there sparring, you know, work on your kata. Right. <laughs> Get away from that Makawara, you know. The, the, so it's, it's not just a, an American thing. And it's a youthful thing, you know. We love to prove how strong we are. We love to be tested. We love to have, have symbols, especially the kids who go into the martial arts generally aren't the athletes of, of the era. You know, right. they're, they're the ones that they might be bookworms or they might be uh, nerds or whatever. And all of a sudden they're into something that now they're respected. And, you know, they're, they want to want to do what they feel is going, is going to make them powerful in the shortest possible time. Uh, we're no different than the Okinawans in that respect. But the emphasis from the senior should always be take your time and do your due diligence and do your studies. And there's a lot of other reasons for practicing martial arts. A lot of sure. those are of much interest though when you're 20 years old and enhance uh, the popularity of uh, mixed martial arts and some of the things that uh, well, the training is more intense. Right, right. Well, I know you're still teaching because I follow your Facebook page and uh, the forums once in a while and uh, I appreciate that you're still teaching because you have so much to give to all of us uh, through your years of experience. Uh, what else are you working on recently? Oh, man. I, I'm busier now than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> uh, what I've been experimenting with is what I, what I call the virtual dojo. And uh, I have a, a website called athomekarate.com that goes into it. But I was probably the first person to uh, use videotapes way back in the late 80s where I had subscriptions. I called them vidmags. And uh, every month would send out uh, like a, a video newsletter. And e every month I had different techniques in there. And I found that the, the people that were getting them were actually, you know, more so than the news. They, they said, hey, I'm well, learning a, a lot of uh, new things from, from your videos. And I said, wow, that, that's a great idea. So I expanded on that. And of course, as technology advanced, uh, it became more possible. Uh, back in the 90s, I held, I, I did some teaching at Boston University on a graduate level in, uh, on a, a program uh, called Leisure Studies. And while I was there, I gave a uh, lecture to all of the professors on the use of online distant learning in the, at a, in the university level. And what I did is I set up cameras, and uh, I had a professor read off of a, of a notebook at a podium, and I was filming him, and then playing it back on the computer. And I said, this is, this is a way that you can communicate your lessons, and you can save them, record them, and uh, distribute them to students. So if 
instead of homework or as, as, a, uh, as another form of homework, people can actually learn from you on their computer. And of course, computers were kind of new at that time. And mm -hmm. you won't believe, there wasn't one professor there that thought this was ever going to be possible. Huh. <laughs> and of course now, you know, every university has their online programs. And as a matter of fact, I think you uh, just had started the, a similar type of program. And, and it's very successful, very, very successful. Right. Another area that I'm working with uh, is the use of impact measuring devices. Uh, I ran, if not the first tournament in the United States, and it had to be one of the early ones. And it was held at a, the Bavarian Hofbrau in Boston. <laughs> this was a nightclub. And we had the tournament up on stage. And of course, I was the only school, so it was just my people. And uh, uh, ever since then, I, I started running a yearly event and trying to come up with, I, I've had a lot to do with making up the original rules, which were published in the Weichi uh, Rukarate Do, my second my third book, I think it was, and I, ever since that time, I've tried to come up with different ways to make tournaments safe and yet competitive and utilizing the, the arts that, that uh, the sport represents. Mm -hmm. Today, you never see much karate in the tournaments. It's just, as uh, Weiji Sensei said, it's like cats and dogs fighting. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, with fine points of, of training. So as, again, as technology advanced, I discovered uh, this program uh, called Herman uh, that uses sensors. Now the first ones were wired sensors and it was quite limited in terms of how it could be utilized. But the latest one was just released and I was test testing it out on this last weekend and it works really well. You can impact uh, like four sensors, uh, one in the helmet and uh, three in the body, uh, in the body armor, you know, can be part of the body armor. And the, uh, the, the, the uh, hit, uh, the timing, the force, and uh, the number of hits all can be recorded and you see it on the screen. And every time someone punches and hits in the area of that target and they go, uh, that has to be hard enough to register, but not so hard that it would be considered to be dangerous. Right. If it's too hard, you get a minus point. And huh. if it's not hard enough, you get a zero. But if you hit that target in a clean blow, it, you'll hear the, the bell will come off in the computer. So tournaments, all of a sudden now, you're going to be training not only to hit targets, but to hit them in a, in a force that will register a point. So this will generate a, a more safety in, in the, the uh, conducting of tournaments. Plus, you don't need four referee, uh, judges. Uh, one single referee is all you really need. And then the, the uh, administrator is sitting at the desk, and everybody can hear when a point is, is called, and all the administrator does is he says A or, or red or white, you know, just then to uh, let, let everybody know which competitor scored the point. So I'm very much into that. We're going to be uh, marketing that pro uh, program. Uh, matter of fact, the first ad is going to be in your magazine. Right, right. Well, I think it's exciting because even on the Q show basis, you know, when you do a, a strike too hard, you tend to use the whole whole hand more than just concentrating on the specific knuckles that you would find in the uh, the Weichikata or uh, a Kyushu practitioner's arsenal. And when you hit too hard, it overwhelms and the body shuts down faster. And when you hit too soft, of course, nothing happens. So by monitoring that certain level that we're looking for, and this is why people don't find Q-Show by accident for the most part, or even when they're looking for it, it takes a long time for their hands to actually pick up the good experience, is because there is a correct amount of force that you have to train yourself with, even in that, that, um, that spontaneous real attack type of um, a scenario. So I think this machine uh, or the device you're working on is brilliant for a Q-Show practitioner. Create the, the parameters of the, the program based on what I was looking for in a in a match. And again, it, it, the problem with point tournaments is that uh, it's so subjective. You know, you see a flurry of hands and arms, and 
it, it's very hard to, to have just calls, call, uh, calls in, in the point match. Right. On the other hand, if we can make it a fun sport, something that in, in order to do a, a, a decent technique, it's not just how many times you can slap and, and kick and punch and all that, but all of a sudden now you're training yourself to accurately go into a target area. It's not just hitting arms and, and legs. So they, they, the more interesting we can make the sport, the, the more chance that there's going to be more uh, of these competitions. And I see that as, as a way to expand on the, the, the karate experience. Many of my friends who own very successful schools don't do tournaments for that reason. Right. You know, it's, it's, a, not a, it, it, it's not a, a, a way that the, the competitor is adding to the martial art experience. All they're doing is they're going in there and they might get a medal or something, but they haven't really learned anything from it. They, from, a, from a stress sense standpoint, they, they learn to combat their fears. But I would like to combine that also with, with the fact that you're using what you're training in. Well, I look forward to seeing this and um, actually uh, sometime in the future maybe even testing it out and using it with my, my people and uh, seeing how it goes because, I, again, I think this has great ramifications not only for your, the sport world as you're intending it for and you, the, the higher levels of skill attainment but also for a Kyushu practitioner uh, getting the targets and the uh, correct pressures is, is essential. So, uh, that sounds good. There's also a lot of other programs uh, for just for training purposes, but what I'm really interested in is, is for the sparring, but it would be perfect. Uh, the, the, the sensors could be uh, set up, and I, I believe they're working right now on allowing the you know, whoever is setting the program up to put in the pressures that they, they want, the minimum and the maximum, so that you you're working on hitting multiple times, maintaining those the goal of being within that for those parameters. That's awesome. It'll also do one more important thing in regards to the Q show, and I, I keep going back to Q show because well, that's my thing. But yeah, um, you cannot hit with the same amount of force if you are using multiple strikes. You have to stagger the amount of force and you have to stagger the timing. So this is a brilliant feedback machine for a Q-Show practitioner. Yeah. Every hit is measured, and it gives a whole re recording, and your average hits, and the, the hardest hit, the lightest hit, and uh, if you go down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see every hit that you, you did during that sequence. Wow, that's great. I look forward to seeing it. Great. Okay, well, I thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. And I look forward to seeing you in the future. It's been a long time since we've um, actually been together uh, on the field or in a training uh, situation. So I look forward to that opportunity as well. Hey, if you come to Florida, we have Winterfest first uh, weekend in March and Summerfest down in Plymouth. We, we uh, have it at, in a soccer stadium, 60,000 square feet. And nice. it's massive. So why don't you come down? You can uh, run some seminars next year. I'll twist my arm, come down to Florida. <laughs> Sounds great, sir. All right, thanks for having me, Evan. Thank you. Take care.